Hello everyone, today we talk about the Constitutio Puritatum of Frederick II. So this is going to be another video on medieval law. And we go to Swabian Sicily during the reign, um, actually also of the old villa under Roger II in part, as we will see for the explanation, but chiefly for in fact the Constitutio Puritatum by Frederick of Oenstaufen, King of Sicily, but as you know, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Italy, King of Germany, etc. This is important because um, this is a very overlooked um, time and uh, character in many ways. I mean, there is objectively not a lot written on Frederick II, which could be amazing if you think about it, because it's one of the single most important historical characters of the world Middle Ages, right? Uh, without no doubt. And um, it was such um, a great person. Uh, whatever judgment you want to give to him, whether positive or negative, uh, this is debated because unfortunately there was a, uh, either a, a praising or a condemnation of it in, in contemporary sources. So this has very much altered our perception of the man. And uh, yet his achievements are, are enormous if we look at several fields of his action. Today we focus on, on the legal one, on the juridical one. Frederick II here, the, the picture, the background is is to realize what the Emperor wanted to do in Sicily. We have seen how uh, Frederick ruled on this uh, extensive area, of, uh, essentially longitudinally speaking, uh, and trying to realize this great dream of the universal uh, empire that would have to rule all of Europe and the Mediterranean. And Sicily, in this regard, was the center of Frederick's action. I mean, in his mind, the empire had to be centralized, either in Rome or preferably uh, or Palermo, actually, where he ruled from in Sicily. Uh, Germany was being given up at that point. Frederick famously granted extensive autonomies to the German princes because he realized that that was not the, the main field of action. Um, he basically, uh, I mean, Frederick felt very deeply his sense of properly Roman emperor, but in Germany he had realized that the uh, decentralization de had taken a path of non-return. This had gone on because of all the, the events that we have partly seen in uh, in other videos i mean the, su the troubled succession of frederick himself but all the you know the, the blows that the hohenstaufen had taken and absorbed in certain ways um, successfully even after lenyan or uh, even after the death um, of in fact of henry the sixth but germany had been messed up and, and frederick act acted in germany formally as in in the full imperial dignity and um, of German kingship th that he embodied, but at the same time acting in practice as just another p territorial prince, and a hell of a very powerful one because Swabia was one of the major powers in there, uh, the duchy plus, um, where th there was a lot of development going on, especially in the area of Switzerland, but also you know in, in the Upper Rhine, and trying to expand especially towards the east, towards Austria, because of the extinction of the Babenberg line. That would, that, you know, he would try to uh, to, to seize. Um, the, uh, the point, though, is um, the that Sicily represented, in this sense, the stable ground on which he could wage his u universal policy. Right, Sicily was a kingdom, a very peculiar one, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, because it was uh, essentially a papal creation. Right, there had been a lot of tribe. I made several videos. I created a playlist on the Hohenstaufen, and so if you want to go take a look at that, when we discuss the succession um, of Frederick, the, uh, the the Swabian as well as the Norman legacy, uh, etc., um, that had caused a lot of problems. But Sicily was theoretically outside of the empire and also practically in many ways the empire stopped essentially to uh, central Italy uh, n n especially from the papal point of view not even the papal states actually belonged to the empire so Sicily was basically in southern peninsular Italy and other possessions like Sardinia or even certain um, posts on, on the African coast belonged in this regard to 
and other creatures to another masters. And and this had been the secular Norman dynasty of the of the Hauteville that had ruled in there uh, as, as monarchs fully entitled uh, so and yet papal vassals f since the 12th century uh, after the conquest of the island in the 11th century um, and, uh, and and this state was it was really a state this is this is important to stress this is there, there is a deep parallelism you can trace between the kingdom of England and the one of Sicily as Norman creations um, and what very few people actually know is that the, the most efficient and centralized um, administrative and juridical system in Europe was effectively the Kingdom of Sicily, that had a massive power. Uh, the, the succession from the Hauteville to the Hohenstaufen hadn't been easy, but let's say that the, the Swabians had inherited the centralized structures that the Normans had built upon the base of, uh, many say it's, it's Byzantine, and um, Islamic legacy, which is in part true, because if you look at the Hauteville court in, in Palermo, you can easily see all these names that were sometimes even openly Greek or Arab, uh, of the various uh, court officials, etc. But it's really about the background, I mean, the, the context of the invasions, uh, just like in uh, in England, and this is why also the East Kingdoms are very similar in many ways, um, there had not been the feudal uh, decentralization that you fin can find in other areas of Europe, France, Germany, Italy, etc. And that's the same reason for which, you know, uh, the uh, Frederick was giving up Germany, for the same exact reason. I mean, his grandfather, Frederick I, had tried to import um, in Germany that was yet not a, a fully feudalized uh, land by the second half of the 12th century, the French uh, by the time, say, w better Western Frankish feudalism that was really the, the source um, of the model into Germany to even rule something in the first place because also feudalism has its own advantages in governability like Germany had never had kind of a, a particular, it was essentially a, had always had a kind of a seigneurial rule um, masked behind this kind of ethnic, old ethnic duchies that tongue and truth weren't, uh, of course, anymore anything like an egalitarian system, socially speaking, but politically they were so, in the sense that in the imperial, uh, the royal assemblies of Germany, that would eventually monopolize the same imperial ones, well, these mm, entities were fundamentally uh, allergic to further centralization, um, in part, uh, but mm, here it's another topic we can't address today. Um, and Sicily represented in, in, instead this pretty massively fertile uh, land in, in, in a pretty damn uh, favorable uh, strategical location in the central Mediterranean, um, so very uh, very close to the Near East um, by sea, uh, distances are all closer, Constantinople. Um, and, and to Central Europe itself, because, you know, you, you cross the Papal States, that was the real logistical problem, and you are in the Italic Kingdom that borders with, with Germany, it's, the, it's all the way there. Um, it was messed up uh, also in this regard, it's partly the reason why Frederick, at the end of the day, failed in, in achieving what he wanted, but enormous figure that tried to stabilize and, and, and centralize further the monarchic power Right, no, so not as an, a Holy Roman Emperor that definitely he he was, but when he dealt with the local um, administration in Sicily, in fact, as a secular, um, uh, as a as a Sicilian king, right? I was about to say Sicula Norman, but um, yeah, t he was a heir also of that. But here the concept went beyond, as we will see today, because there is the attempt of kind of universalizing um, power even in uh, and from the Kingdom of Sicily. Um, and this could be achieved juridically, and that's why law is so dramatically important when you want to understand anything of how power was effectively exercised in, uh, in the Middle Ages, right? Because it's not just about how many troops you have, the military deterrent that effectively makes a freaking law in that regard. So this starts being also economical, of course, but that's the core of the problem where's your right to exact taxes? Because the, the problem of the Middle Ages basically revolves all around this. Yes, it's about money, it's about power, but you must be entitled and legitimized, authorized to levy taxes, which uh, 
at that time wasn't easy at all because there was in fact no um, real uh, centralized structure as we conceive it in modern terms um, and yet Sicily was the kingdom that under the Normans and the Swabians went the closest basically to a form of centralization and of sur in surpassing the prerogatives of the local customs so that the king himself by essentially by the, as a divine medium this was the idea that the sacrality of the monarchy uh, could um, could emanate laws on his own right and m having them applicated uh, at a local level so this is the point and we we have started only from a, from a few time to discuss about history of law we should start talking about the use proprium proper like the in, in medieval times the use proprium was the right of the law the, the law let's say of the local uh, ordinaments so we're talking about uh, feuds communes but even guilds um, and monarchical states alike and this was considered particular compared to the universal right of the empire in the sense that it was something that was aside from it yet tied in in this uh, relation for which the emperor had basically to grant to local customs um, the, the, the effective applicability I mean to to exercise justice in the name of those customs now the thing is complicated because we we will approach also the concept, in fact, of universal law exactly here. I mean, the obvious attempt from the side of these monarchs, right, which is very evident at the time of the Orange and think about Frederick II that boosted those Bolognese scholars to to recover Roman law like crazy because that was detached first of all by the Church uh, as a source of law and and therefore uh, th there could be this absolute law that uh, Euro in Western Europe had been lost during early medieval times because the customs had basically taken over whether they were um, they were usually hybrid between Roman and Germanic law um, but they were considered in this sense as common law and in fact uh, you understand the uh, you know the, the size the volume of, of these statements but we're talking about very big systems and of problems that still characterize uh, and differentiate our societies today um, but let's say the, the sources of the use problem were usually the in fact, the customs, like such as for the, I don't know, feudal law, for example, or the statutes for the communes and the corporations, um, and other mm, consolidated bodies of norms emanated usually by the monarchies. And so, common law was next to the use proprium, with essentially certain integrative and subsidiary function that were, in, th in this sense, orientated to regulate the concrete, the legal reality at court. Um, especially in those cases, and this was the area in which the use problem could fit um, in within, let's say, the, 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 the ocean of the common law, meaning common law really has different laws also in here, different, different customs, etc. Um, where the latter was fragmentary, like it lacked certain norms, it didn't work uh, at certain levels, especially now where European society had expanded a lot and very fast, right? Definitely uh, keeping up with the general, you know, adaptation of these laws to practical reality, but still, you know, f meeting these um, at a political level, especially this kind of resistance, obviously, uh, against the attempts of centralization from the side of the monarchy. So you understand that for Frederick II that embodied universal power in Western Europe, well, at that point, this was a big problem. I mean, trying to surpass um, local particularism, let's say, and uh, homogenizing the administrative practice, that something that, in, in, in this sense, in Sicily was basically uh, the most advanced all over than the rest of Europe, right, uh, of at least of Latin Germanic Europe as such, and uh, Slavic Europe. Um, so that strictly, in fact, we could call... Mm, it's difficult to, to give it an adjective and kind of an anecdotal base because there wasn't effectively, but let's say it was broader Western European area. So we have seen how uh, one of the sources of the use problem was constituted by the laws of the monarch.
and in the Kingdom of Sicily, these laws had been consistently important. We don't have the time today, unfortunately, to look at the before. Uh, maybe we, sh we should do things in chronological order, but we will get to that, so I hope at one point there will be a video that explains these other uh, important collections of, of the Sicilian Norman Kingdom. The Assize of Ariano was an exceptional document dated to 1141, which had uh, expressed essentially the right of the sovereign to essentially intervene in common law by essentially uh, correcting the existing uh, customs if these were contrary to superior principles of justice, of equity and rationality. Um, in this sense uh, the idea was that the sovereign was r ruling for uh, divine mandate and there, therefore there was the superior authority that the secular Norman monarchs uh, as we have said had had the, the possibility of, of enhancing right thanks to their um, possibility of centralizing since the beginning uh, in this system. And the other great collection of the Sicilian kingdom is but especially in Swabian time the uh, Liber Augustalis of Frederick the uh, second himself. Um, so the li these these were uh, bodies of, of laws substantially. Liber Augustalis especially was emanated in 1231 at Melfi by uh, Frederick and uh, it's known as Constituciones Regni Sicilia or uh, other also Constituciones Melfitane or Augustales in fact um, and th these norms have different mm, you know backgrounds different origins but we, we let's not focus on that uh, but let's focus today on the most important of the of Frederick's constitutions the one that begins with the word Puritatem and which is by far the most important because it deals with what we have discussed at the beginning about the, the meaning of the qualification of common attributed to Roman law in the Middle Ages. Right? We have seen how also in other videos uh, in the with the Bolognese school especially how this was was meaningful why Roman law was recovered. Now we don't have time to 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 discuss this again just if you're interested go look at that and um, to do we have really a lot to, to discuss so let's simply analyze the Puritatum wh what it's really about so this constitution basically disposed certain treasures and bailiffs certain royal treasures and bailiffs in Latin quote Prompto zelo justitiam ministrabunt et quod secundum constitutiones nostras et in defectu earum secundum consuetudines ad probatas ac demum secundum jura communia langobardorum vide dicet et romanorum pro ut qualitas litigantium exiget judicabunt. Now this is a extreme importance right did this passage here especially because what this text means basically is that th there was a year here that it's indicated by the monarch to his own provincial magistrates that contemplated the recourse first of all to the royal constitutions that had already abolished the local costumes that were contrary to uh, equity and rationality and substituting them with uh, just and rational rules right secondarily to those uh, customs that have uh, having not been yet corrected by the legislative intervention of the sovereigns were to consider corrected um, uh, at the point that they, they could mm, find a regular application in the course of justice and latter where not even this source could be found uh, for the norm useful to the case could be found well then at this point 
and this is the real big thing, they could recur to Longobard low and Roman low, both indicated apparently with the qualification of use commune, that is common law. Now this statement is, is massive for many reasons, now we'll explain gradually why. But basically you understand here what, what's the deal, that there are three layers of um, juridical sources. The first one is one of the sovereign, right? which was considered the first and most important. We've seen with the Assis of Ariano that this was kind of the, at least the, the, the juridical base that the Norman kings had given to their own kingdoms and Frederick was simply following the local tradition in that regard. Uh, secondly, there was these local customs that had developed at all levels of society, like it was extremely free, everybody made the customs evolve, right? So whichever the matter was, whichever the community had mm, essentially secured over time as a, as a local custom, recognized it was fine, always given that the royal uh, intervention could modify these customs as well. This is, this is exceptional in, 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 in rest, uh, you know, for Europe at that time. This is the only country I'm aware um, such thing happened. Like it was an exception that confirmed the rule of, of all the other kingdoms where the sovereign was called just to safeguard the local customs, not to modify them. This is extremely important and it tells you on which grounds and Frederick was, was reasoning at this point. And uh, th this guy was, was a genius in many ways. I mean, he had um, really, he was acquainted, think about what it means to be acquainted with uh, German, um, Italian, Sicilian, uh, Jewish, um, Muslim um, culture, all at once. Uh, Greek, uh, too, considering the importance, even the influences from the, 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 the Byzantine Empire from uh, into Sicily. And having been actually grown old, in, especially in Sicily, in Palermo, like he had done when he was a, a teenager, let's say. Uh, and, and, and what all of these cauldron of, of ideas, of models, of power, of, of influxes, of reflections. He, we all know how Frederick was a philosopher, he was a, a scientist in his own regard, he, he wrote treatises, he, he had uh, stru marvelous structures built, or no, knowing of astro knowledge of astronomy, of many, he, he was a really a hell of a person. Uh, and, and therefore, realizing fully at this various levels what is fascinating of Frederick II he fully realized how he had to cope with all the various communities he, he was dealing with like with the Germans he behaved like a German uh, with the Sicilians he behaved like a Sicilian uh, he had all different faces he used when he was again clashing against the Lombard League when he was dealing with the with the Sultan of Egypt um, uh, there was a a deep, uh, with, with the Pope, Frederick was theoretically a adoptive son of, of St. Peter, Vikers. Like, this is very important in, in, in the world picture. But the thing that, that is really incredible here is that there is a third layer, that there is not just the sovereign at this point in the local customs, there is another way. Which is the idea that there is a common law This case in the Kingdom of Sicily, but this idea of, of that there was a common law, uh, let, let's leave aside the, the strict national um, traditions, like you can see in England pretty easily, right? But there was a common law that was actually responding to all the barriers, let's say, it's anachronistic to speak like this, but it, this kind of national, ethnical, better, uh, laws that the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages had always been been about and had formed in this sense, intertwined all with feudal laws. It was a total mess, right? But back in the day, there had been this concept of Roman law. These were lands where the Roman Empire had ruled. And there was a single, a single state, a single law, and it was the emperor who decided it, right? So this thing had never fallen out of use. And the Bolognese school, as we we are going to see here, was recovering Roman law in part, acknowledging that this could be a common law of some kind. So, uh, if you're interested, go look at that video about uh, Irnerius, uh, that, that talks about Irnerius from Bologna. 
Um, but here there is something else that would be actually developed even by the great Bolognese school much later that would be adopted by half of Europe. Um, and, and this is the concept of, of common law attributed at this point apparently to Longbird law which is surely extraneous to what would have become because the Longbird law was, was abandoned eventually with Roman law um, even in the north, I mean when the Longbird law would be in central northern Italy had remained the, the strongest thing here but Roman law proper right here there was the recognition of this uh, idea of com of of, of uh, law that basically was at the base of everything right before actually one one more one century before that this was fully developed eventually by the Bolognese school which was the one that became um, universal in the sense because half of Europe kind of recognized that, that was the way right while well, others took other paths but you know for what concerned the the kingdom of Sicily this was a, a kind of a peculiar realization because uh, the Kingdom of Sicily hadn't had the same um, juridical traditions of uh, but juridical studies and research that the, the, the communes of the north have had. It was a, a, a completely different background that we have observed before. And there's been a huge debate about this uh, passage of the uh, Constitutio Puritatum. Why? Well, because there have been several interpretations that eventually have been correct like uh, so Frederick's constitution at this point has been debated essentially because on, on this qualification on uh, common law attributed uh, not just to Roman law but also to the Longbird law right this is very interesting and somehow interpreted this as if basically Longobard and Roman law were put basically at the same level, right? This was the mainstream idea up to relatively few decades ago, like 30, 20, 30 years ago. And in particular, the definition of Roman law as common law for the Kingdom of Sicily has been interpreted naturally in some ways before as the addition of the Sicilian juridical thought to the idea of Roman law as universal law um, provided with this superior and universal authority that would be eventually elaborated by the great Bolognese doctrine. And in particular, certain scholars uh, were supporting the idea that Frederick II had defined as common the Roman law because he basically would have shared the, the conclusions of the contemporary juridical signs. I mean, of course, that this was still the, the Italian peninsula. Ideas circulated, this were, were, you know, areas were all in contact. I mean, the same Frederick lived for many times, most on camping, but in northern Italy. Uh, so he was definitely acquainted to, to these uh, theories, to these ideas. I mean, Frederick II in Sicily was really the heart of the Mediterranean at that point. Um, and and, and, and scholars interpreted also the, the Longbird, the man, the qualification of Longbird law as common law, not much because maybe Frederick considered it at the same level of the Roman one, but just because he recognized it as the general territorial law of the communities of some uh, Sicilian regions, right? We, we're talking about Sicilian here, you obviously understand we're not talking just about Sicily, right? The, the kingdom is the kingdom of Sicily and in this sense it encompassed large areas of southern, even central Italy we've seen before. Um, and an objectively great part of um, uh, Apenninic uh, uh, southern Italy had traditionally been of Longbird law, like I mean, the, the interland, the up, the, the the area that, by the way, also was kind of the less um, easy to control from from Sicily as such, was identically Longbird, like uh, f from from early medieval times that had remained the, in fact, effectively the common law. Like, who were you if you were in Benevent? It was one of the uh, Longbird duchies of the south. We made a video on the southern Longbirds. Well, you were a Longbird. Because your identity was was juridical, that that was your ethnic identity at that point. To which law do you respond? 
to the longbird one. Fine, so you are you are a longbird. Of course, the thing was flexible, but still tradition had maintained that. So that was objectively in certain areas the the prevalent uh, the prevalent system juridical system in force. Right uh, now, this interpretation was was very common up to as we were saying, in fact, thirty years ago. Certain doubts were arising, though, because um, first of all, thinking about here, we're, we're talking about Roman law. Of course, you know we are talking about the Corpus Juris Civilis by Justinian, right? Um, and relatively to it, we have to think that the elevation of this code to uh, to common law was matured only with the commentators that would have developed actually only in the mid if not the second half of the 14th century you know very well Frederick the second is from the, the, the end of the 12th the first half of the 13th century so um, also uh, at a geographical level the the concept of of mm, Roman law as common law fully developed also belonged specifically to central northern Italy not to the south so this is actually a pretty macroscopic datum right and it, it, it makes it appear necessary this traditional interpretation of the Puritatum uh, starting from the qualification of common law of the Sicilian kingdom attributed uh, by the constitution to Roman law. So for what concerns first of all the dating of the passage of the Puritatum, um, our, our attention goes chiefly to um, Sturner who made this, more, I don't know how more recent editions there are, but this is from 1996, uh, the most recent edition of the Liber Augustalis itself, that actually judges the Puritatum as an uh, as an addition, right, to the text of 1231, right, that happened before 1246. And other scholars also recognize that the Puritatum as uh, basically as an interpolation that it should be dated later to the Liber Augustalis itself, um, attributing it, um, however, to the end of the 13th century, right? Uh, so after that Frederick had died in 1250, um, which is mm, a, a big ph philological problem in the sense that we, we don't, um, like, th there was a lot of ease in the way these texts were managed um, in that period, so we can't date precisely, right, this the Puritatum in itself, but we think he might have been concretely emanated at the time of Frederick. Um, and, and this dating, however, wh whichever you pick, doesn't change a, a datum that appears to be decisive, th which is that the passage of the Puritatum is much previous to the theorization of Roman law as common, u universal common law. And on the other hand, it's not the only text of the Liber Augustalis to define Roman law as common. In fact, there are many constitutions of the originary uh, body of laws in which um, um, Justinian norms, right, of substantial trial nature are qualified um, as, in fact, common law. And there are several here, but let's not make a list of all the various uh, sources. But the, for example, the the Constitution de Violences et Maleficis Clandestines, from datable certainly to 1231, talks about specifically quote utrunque ius langobardorum videlicet et commune. So this 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 text is particularly uh, important because it says literally both the uh, laws, which is one of the one of the longbirds 
and the other the the common one so here specifically you have something different from the puritatum apparently uh, which is that the adjective common uh, is referred only to Roman law not to the Longobard one as a consequence therefore the Friedrich's uh, text um, and um, also whether the original the one other stuff was added later however defined currently during the 13th century Roman law as common and as a consequence if the uh, conclusions that we have uh, mentioned before are correct attributed to disqualification a different meaning from the one that the glossarists came to mature a century later on the mid or the second half of the 14th century and by the way in in relation with a different institutional reality the one of the communes that was consistently different from the one of the Sicilian kingdom but by the way at that time it was also split into uh, rules um, it was differentiating from from this moment in which you know and in Swabian times it was one block and it it, it had a substantial amount of sort of Norman legacy still alive and, and functional more than else the Angevins later on would continue that a little bit but th the system was was heavily compromised after all the various wars of conquest etc and uh, but in order therefore however to to understand the meaning of the definition of the Sicilian legislative text it seems to be uh, fair to take in consideration the thought of the medieval Sicilian jurists on the validity of Roman law in the kingdom. So according to Marino da Caramanico, which is, uh, was an author of the uh, ordinary uh, glocks of uh, the Liber Augustalis, Roman law was observed in the Sicilian kingdom in virtue of the will, either explicit or implicit, of the monarchs and it was differently from other laws, such as the Frankish one, for example, common law of the Sicilian regions, uh, provinces. So, the thesis of the royal permission, let's say, was eventually recovered by another jurist, Andrea di Zernia, who stated that the juridical history of such provinces was articulated in two phases that basically are separated in time from the donation of Constantine that had allegedly uh, disposed the session of uh, this same um, concessions per permissions to to the church hmm? and um, in in and after right and and uh, according to him according to the jurist in the first phase Roman law was actually uh, valid in those um, lands in a kind of direct and immediate way uh, basically in the same way it happened in the rest of the Empire while in, in the second phase it was observed so after the, the nation of Constantine it was observed in virtue of the conformity to the ratio and consequently of the equitas Right, so the the rationality and the the equity or equality um, that um, basically was expressed um, and realized by a superior instance of justice that, in this sense, was embodied by the local monarch. So the thesis of Andrea di Zernia can be comprehended exactly if we put it in, in relation with what we have observed. Um, you know about the meaning of the of the royal law in the kingdom of Sicily with Roger II and Frederick II we see the proclamation of the duplex mm, duty of the monarch directly entrusted to him by God to abrogate from one side the, the unjust and irrational juridical norms and on the other hand to preserve and defend the observance of, of the just and rational ones and among the latter at full title had to be included the norms of the Justinian collection which was the 
ultimate expression of the ratio and equitas as Roman law. Think about the perpetua sanctio, right? Uh, the Theodosian, the, the idea that th this law had been emanated to basically rule all the universal empire in a kind of a basically unchangeable way, as if that was a perfect system that could not be altered. It was a great dream, eventually it was recollected by Justine, and, and it, it passed on into medieval history when it was recovered in the West as the, the point of the situation, even though, I mean, especially it was uh, extremely appealable to, to these universal powers, but naturally uh, there is a reason why it effectively it didn't quite succeed, they didn't succeed themselves in their political aims, but also why uh, this uh, full extension of uh, Roman law as, as universal common law di didn't happen uh, everywhere, um, in, and also in different measures, by the way, where, where it happened. Um, so what this means here is that from one side to uh, the sovereigns, uh, the Sicilian sovereigns recognized the nature of ratio iuris to Roman law, so that it had a kind of a, a broader, you know, intelligence and, um, and, and rationality you could revert to, right? It was a logical system. It was also a very, a very sophisticated one. It had several juridical institutions. It was a pretty complex text, right, that, that was being recovered at this point in its entirety, um, or almost uh, all of it. Um, it, from from one side, uh, the uh, the same monarchs uh, legitimized the observance of uh, within the kingdom of the same law without any modification of its norms, right? So this is a peculiar thought um, that we we observe both in Caramanico and from Iserni that could can be. Mm, understood if th the same thought is mm, compared with the one of Luca da Penne, who was one of the, the greatest jurists of the second half of the 14th century, a Neapolitan, so here uh, actually the, the, the Kingdom of Naples had kind of inherited the, the, the Sicilian legacy in this regard, also in juridical studies, also because Frederick II had actually uh, created himself a university in Naples to kind of uh, compete uh, with the, uh, the with Bologna uh, itself, so it was a, a massive juridical effort from the side of Frederick II eventually to 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 ab absorb and receive much of the notions that indeed were present at the time. Um, so Luca da Penne um, received um, later on and in kind of a more sensitive way the results reached by the great um, uh, the, the major doctrine of the of central and northern Italy at a point here we are in fact in the 14th century so we're, we're one century later compared to the Puritatum and the Penne's idea on the nature of Roman law as common law matches in fact with uh, the one that the great juridical science of the glossarists uh, was defining around the same years. Solum ius Romanum, he stated, dicitur ius commune. Um, so this is very important because here it's the Roman law becomes the universal common law, right? And as a consequence, it didn't have to go back to, for example, to the chronology of, of nor to the royal permission and to the rationabilitas of the Roman law in order to legitimize its observance in the kingdom. The ideas of Luca da Penne appear, however, kind of eccentric when compared also with the, um, in the tradition of interpretation of the say the, the, the Sicilian doctrine like let's put it as Sicilian because technically uh, even in the Neapolitan kingdom at the time the, the official name was kingdom of Sicily right because there had been the Vespers so from one side you have the Angevins the other side you have the Aragonese but they both thought uh, being aware by the way of this potent um, institutional and juridical legacy of the Sicilian kingdom that they were it's as if they were chunks of the same thing, right? There was theoretically still the same uh, 
Sicilian kingdom. And that, that, that's, that's and, and, and the legacy of it was important because they were trying to legitimize each other to be Sicilian kings and theoretically re reunifying the thing. And it wouldn't happen until the, the mid 15th century, right, under the same rule. And yet the two chunks had remained kind of institutionally divided um, as different vice kingdoms, right? But we're talking here about a strictly Sicilian legacy. Right from the time of the Normans and of the Swedes, um, because um, if you, th there are other scholars. For example, uh, Matteo da Flitto, who came later. In fact, in the 15th century, as such, who basically recovered Caramanico and Disernia and started saying something something different. He he repeated essentially that the Roman law had to be divided in two parts. The first one was constituted by the norms preceding uh, the, the nation of Constantine and those who had came after this event. So the first had entered immediately in force in the Sicilian area and had eventually continued to be for the will of the pontiffs and of the kings that had governed uh, one after another uh, the territory. The latter instead found in its a rational nature and in the consequence royal consensus the foundation of its own legitimacy so the uh, dominant interpretative address orientation in the uh, Sicilian doctrine then so Roman law as the law of the sovereigns rational and therefore uh, needless of modification. These were norms that both in the first historical phase and in the second had to do basically with all the communities and all the provinces of the kingdom. In the same way it had happened for the territories and the universities in other regions of the ancient Roman Empire. So this juridical patrimony had remained uh, in force, valid, even after the end of the of the empire was a validity which naturally had continued to uh, to be proper of all those territories encompassed by the the kingdom of Sicily. As such, it couldn't be therefore considered as the foundation of the. It could be considered as the foundation of the local customs that express the problems and the particular needs of each community. The Roman law founded on the Libri Legales after the, um, the recovery of the, uh, of the texts from the, from the code and that were eventually commented and taught in the Neapolitan University constituted therefore the common matrix of the local customs that uh, referred uh, basically entirely or in part to a legitimate and just tradition dating back to the ancient Roman domination. So the usages and the customs of the Sicilian communities um, didn't just um, have a Roman origin, though, because the long, long bird domination in white territories had had the consequence to add to the first a matrix of the customary law of that people specifically. It's a law that in fact um, it was based on a text, the Lombarda, which was inserted in the Libri Legales that had become an object of study in teaching at in Naples. Not only because we have uh, we made that video on the um, on the Longobard and Frankish legacy in the recovery of Roman law, we have observed how this happened fundamentally, and you see that th this idea is that th there was a common, um, s uh, you know, uh, feeling about the the contribution, definitely that, uh, especially in origin, the uh, local laws had uh, done. Paradoxically, the, the Longobard law had been much more important in the north that came to eventually disregard the. The, the Longobard law as such, then what it was in the Kingdom of Sicily that had actually a much more varied uh, ethnic uh, 
uh, background, juridical background. I mean, there were so many different customs at that point, right? But this mm, large areas, right, and some of the most compact and widespread of these laws were effectively was effectively Longbert one, especially in many areas of the southern peninsular interland. There were some of well, so the most important in this regard. Um, hence, the legitimacy of the nature of of, of common, common law also for the Longbert one. Uh, a legitimacy that was recognized by the majority of Sicilian lawyers of medieval and modern uh, times um, that discussed um, among them also uh, on, on actually only one point uh, that is whether this nature had to be tied to the only to the communities of Longobard Nazio, so those who had effectively been under the Longobard uh, duchies and had retained the Longobard law as common law, or to those singular territories only, in fact, this is the concept, or to the whole kingdom. Th this is the, uh, the debate, because, and this reveals, by the way, how imposant at that point uh, the the, the Longbird law actually was because in, in the meanwhile, here we're talking in fact of late Middle Ages and early modern age. Well, by that point, the actual center of uh, of the Sicilian kingdom wasn't Sicily anymore. It was Naples, right? Sicily, after the death of Frederick II, underwent this major rapid decline. It lasted long because it was still a hell of, uh, you know, uh, of land in terms of fertility of wealth, but socially it was disrupted and, and Naples was the strongest uh, center of power. That was the, where the, the Angevins shifted the capital when they conquered it from Manfred, the son of Frederick. And, 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 though and, and that place where effectively the um, institutional and administrative traditions of the Sicilian kingdom survived more in continuity. I mean, we're talking about the Norman and his Swabian legacy proper, right? Um, and later on, it, it would be like that, because, you know, the Longobards had never ruled on Sicily, while they had ruled on large parts of the of Southern Peninsula uh, Italy. So, um, at this point, for example, you know, imagine that, that in those times, in the early Middle Ages, uh, the Byzantines had retained ju largely just the coasts, and uh, the Longobards had expanded of almost all the internal territory. So it was a massive thing, it was really about the, the countryside, about, I mean, the, the, the demographic bulk of the population, and those were, you know, fairly advanced, very powerful areas. I mean, the Kingdom of Sicily in the late Middle Ages, or the early modern age, w was a, you know, w w was a might to be reckoned with, and, and, and there was this, this feeling of belonging to this older tradition. In fact, the Longbird Law was disbanded only with, I think, with the Italian unification, because the, the, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies maintained, retained these local customs, or actually not with the Italian unification, I think maybe with the constitution of the 20s of the 19th century, but I, I mean very late in time, we're talking about post-Napoleonic times, so when the state for many countries in Europe had become de facto the only source of law, so when at that point, local customs, so typical of the Ancien Regime, were, were you know, wiped out. But this is very important in general, because if, if we consider this all, uh, the norm of the um, Constitutio Puritatem can be read as um, an order to the royal magistrates to judge the disputes that were, you know, presented to them by essentially seeking norms that were useful, first of all, um, in the royal constitutions that had substituted the unequal uh, uses, in second place over the laws, of, uh, when the lower laws of the monarch didn't have touched this matter, um, and basically looking instead as a thir third and I very important option turning to this immense and heterogeneous mass of um, uh, of c uh, local customs that have not been abolished had to be believed to be just and rational 
at the point of finding an ordinary application in the local courts and finally were not not even this this you know this option was viable where no disposition would have been found idoneous in this regard by essentially acquiring it from the interpretation of the Libri Legalis that contained the texts of both laws the Roman and the Longobard one because they had been united together by the tradition and this constituted the common matrix of the um, of the customs observed by the communities of the kingdom so in the absentation of the Swabian law therefore the adjective common seems to have uh, an imminently were not exclusively territorial significance and this is probably one another very important concept not much because uh, during Norman and Swabian times the, the monarchs had managed basically to not only to, to unify um, this southern Italian and Sicilian territories that had since Roman times basically never been united anymore ter politically speaking but also to homogenize and in this regard uh, I mean fluidify in general juridical practice by arriving to consider that Roman and Longobard law that objectively had been also the mo some of the most important local um, traditions if you think about it because of the Byzantine legacy and the Longobard legacy proper um, uh, as the the base to which revert now this is very interesting we should deepen how this interaction also happened like we of course um, there there's a sound difference between what was effectively Roman law and the Longobard one so it would be interesting to see how often the Longobard one was applicated in, in which way but um, this is uh, particularly important because it makes you also reflect on another aspect so these were high medieval times or low medieval times if you want um, but uh, this idea that there was a basically a hybrid between a Roman and a Germanic law is something that dated back to to very to late antique if not uh, in early medieval times in many ways we still haven't uh, looked at this, but if you take the Lex Romana Visigotorum and the Lex Romana Burgundionum, for example, there were the laws of respect to the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain and the Burgundian Kingdom of uh, basically of southern southeastern France. Uh, well, we realize that you have basically the the fusion, you could say, of the uh, Visigothic and Bur Burgundian uh, laws respectively uh, with the Roman um, with the customs of the Roman communities right at that point it wasn't strictly the Justinian code but because in in among the Visigoths and the Burgundians uh, Roman law itself had undergone some uh, changes chiefly simplifications but in this regard they had um, it had even taken over partly the same Germanic law in, in, in those kingdoms there were of Germanic foundation because there weren't uh, Roman Empire anymore nor uh, uh, affiliation of it um, and we have seen also in that video about the Frankish and Longobard, uh, Longobard legacy in the recovery of, of Roman law for what concerns the, the Bolognese tradition and therefore the one of the Italic Kingdom central and northern Italy that had been under Longobard law and, and eventually yes of course Frankish and partly Ottonian um, as a but still in the wake of essentially the, the Longobard Kingdom that even during Carolingian times was the Longobard Kingdom as such by in as a crown as, as in as a distant crown that Charlemagne wanted it possibly to be so well you realize that even in there in the recovery of Roman law by the Bolognese and the, the other schools um, of Pavia for example the same capital of Longobard Kingdom you have former capital you had pieces of the Lex Romana Vig Visigotorum for example and of the Edictum Theodorici so the Ostrogothic law that had been present in Italy so you realize that in in this southern European lands uh, 
the the idea after all of considering Germ uh, and this is valid especially for for the Sicilian kingdom rather than for 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 central and northern Italy that instead remained Germanic juridically speaking but that at least even in there specifically uh, uh, there, there could be a fusion between all of these laws as a sort of of complement to this idea of, of general law essentially I mean that that eventually was to be uh, to be to revert back to the, to the Roman one and still I mean not the complete one because it took like up to the Renaissance to complete the recomposition yeah, I mean the reconstitution say of the uh, of the Justinian encode but the, the majority of it the Libri Legales fundamentally over which, in fact, the Bolognese started, and this thing ex where it was exported everywhere, and as we have seen even in, in Naples, well, they were essentially studying the same texts. Um, but it, it's still important, very important, because it's as if, um, in spite of this great uh, uh, juridical differentiation that had existed formerly in the Sicilian kingdom, where you ha in the formerly ter former territories you had Longobards, Byzantines, uh, Arabs, right? So you had an, an, an islands even of different, um, and considering the church and all this, there were different churches. There were the Jews that had their own law. So that that's quite. It's probably uh, one of the most highly probably the kingdom, the territories of of what would become the, the Sicilian kingdom was were the most composite. Uh, ethnically speaking at that point, but yet they managed to make work this idea that there was a sort of national background um, from which to draw the uh, the laws specifically because that was the point and 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 all of this largely thanks not just to the local to, to the major local uh in fact, juridical traditions that even existed and had had a development of, of of considerable kind, but also to the centralization of the of the of the Norman and Swabian monarchies, right? And this enhancement of the role of central uh, of the monarch essentially in a, a, of a law maker to impose on a kind of a broader general. Um, nationality. Of course, this th th there is a finesse in here, because if you look at it, it's not that here the king literally emanated uh, who knows how much law by itself. I mean, it's still an exception. It's, in, it's amazing in the history of the world medieval uh, law. There is nothing like this in the West, but at the same time, it's still, it's not that the, 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 the king could emanate literally every kind of law he wanted he hi had either to correct a local custom that seemed to be unjust and, um, and irrational which is i give you it's pretty um, i mean it's pretty it sounds at least pretty vague but I, I suspect that in the practice there were pretty sound limits to this and 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 therefore it's a quite intelligent way to put it in my opinion but but also um drawing from this this common law background that uh, yeah in turn was also another way to to essentially boost uh, monarchic power because that show that that look looked as if th the monarch had an external source of law that was kind of paralleling the universality of of the of of their power um, and this is very fascinating because essentially you have like uh, the, the the customary law in this regard pressed from uh, one side by uh, like between uh, hammer and anvil right from one side you have the monarch from the other side you have this universal law right uh, and that is ver that is secular still in nature but the idea is, is still that these Sicilian monarchs thought of themselves to be essentially sacred like the Sicilo Norman monarchy had drawn heavily, for example, from from Constantinople in terms of imperial grandeur, this idea that they had to dominate the major. I mean, the Sicilo Normans were pretty damn, damn aggressive strategically. They they were they were a power to be reckoned with. They expanded in the Near East with the Crusades. They had quite a, a 
even a maritime breach, especially in the first and in the eleventh, twelfth century. Um, and, and Frederick the Second was known, but the Holy Roman Emperor himself, in this case, also King of Sicily. But hey, uh, you are a universal ruler by law at that point, recognized even by the papacy when he was not excommunicated, but still you were the guy, right? You weren't a, a, um, a ruler like anyone else. But still it's interesting that in spite of this, even Frederick II was drawing not from from an imperial tradition, but from a local secular Norman tradition of power that had been instated since the, the the first half of the 12th century, which is a pretty damn old in time. So you can think about this um, in perspective, what it means uh, in by the 12th century to claim to have this kind of juridical prerogatives out there, and, and especially being able to enforce them, then of course it's not that the sequel of Normans had, had always easy to control Sicily, but in, in many ways it was way more f effective that basically I think legitimately all European kingdoms, except maybe and just maybe England, um, but maybe because it, I, I think personally, Kingdom of Sicily was more centralized in that regard, or at least more functional um, in 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 many ways. Um, so mm, there is another idea, which is that the the, mm, the glossarists while mm, in maturing the thesis of the Roman, uh, for which the Roman law couldn't be considered not merely civil but at the full title common, weren't actually overlooking the fact that um, there was a, a, a great deal of uh, norms of, for example, the communal statutes in the north of Italy, um, such as that that were, especially by the 14th century when the concept of common law was fully expressed were pretty damn numerous and complex like these guys were creating regional states so um, they weren't really um, you know th th this idea of the common law of as a universal law wasn't ever quite effective in, in the practice it was just at a juridical level very important because it could basically fill the gaps that were left uncovered in this essentially by, the, by these um, ju legal juridical systems that were, were fi very complex, right? We will have to deepen this topic because even on that front, I mean, uh, there were certain powers that came to theorize even the full freedom. This happened in Florence, pretty late in time, still very detached from reality, but the Florentine jurists it went as far at one point as claiming that Florence was basically free by any single secular power, including the emperor, which which is I mean in medieval perspective is absurd. I think I've never heard anything like this everywhere. It, th that was not even the mainstream thinking in Florence, right? But the fact that there were organisms now that were able to formulate these ideas is quite meaningful. And it, it kind of flips the coin when when you look at you know here we we look at the kingdom of Sicily that is essentially a feudal kingdom, it has if you want similar characteristics to others. What was happening in the north and central Italy is I, I, and, fr is, and also f from a juridical point of view must to be understood in a very different picture than even the most autonomous city states in the rest of Europe objectively didn't didn't know in that measure um, but yeah and uh, I think this is the uh, I think this is the point at the end of the day um, th there will be a lot more to add I think uh, I haven't in the first year I started Schwerpunkt made a lot of videos about Frederick the second and I think this is the first one after a long time I don't decide that because, as you know, I choose my topics randomly. But that's another hell of figure we must study pretty damn seriously at one point. Uh, now, maybe dealing in this manualistic terms, we don't have the time to focus, to concentrate on him. But, you know, we, we have to tell the story because 
that's something that really changed. Like, it, that's possibly in absolute terms my favorite period ever. Like, the 13th century to me is, is the most fascinating. I, I studied chiefly the 14th um, in the end of the 13th, but uh, for other reasons, let's say, of because, you know, that's where you can fish more uh, in, in this peculiar historiographical time. But in terms of sheer historical interest and beauty and fascination, to me, I mean, Frederick II embodies, um, uh, it embodies, it's enormous, the, the, the volume of, 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 of significance that that figure had at the end of universalism, in, uh, at the, you know, in, in the face of the rise of national monarchies, of the crisis of the Crusades, um, of, of lots of, of, of territorialization of power, that, that's really uh, a chapter we have to study. But I was happy today to talk about this specifically because it seems to me that um, I think the figure of Frederick the Second is remembered just, ah, oh, yeah, this guy there did something, right? But most people don't even know about him. Like, um, they don't even consider as a whole the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, or Italy, or Sicily as a system as such, uh, or Burgundy or Bohemia, uh, the, the, the implications in the Crusades, I mean, it looks like quite foggy because we're used somewhat to the idea of nation-state and we don't understand the effective power that these guys detained and from the other side the major fort to, to stamp their attempt of centralization. Um, um, I think it was actually Frederick the first that went the closest to achieve the thing, which was simply reuniting um, the two empires um, and creating a universal monarchy over Europe and the Mediterranean. That those were he and Henry the Sixth together were were about to get it right. And they other plans got in the way, right, including. Uh, definitely uh, dynastic problems, the resistance of the papacy, of the Lombard League, of of, of, uh, of the German princes also in, in at home. Uh, it wasn't easy, right? But um, at the same time, those were the guys who truly believed in this stuff. And it's kind of bad that nationalist more, um, historiography in the 19th century, uh, especially in Germany, kind of said, oh, well, this Swabian side, I wanted to go to Italy, what they did go there for, it was a chimera, the, they failed, it was bad, they made the, the German national monarchy fail. Those guys were about to reach what only the Romans had managed to do. And if they had done it, they were about to do it, right? And the story, uh, it's also sad to see, it. you know, I, I, as you understand, uh, being more about the late 13th and, and the early 14th century, I also have my ideas regarding the fact that it, that even later events, I mean, think about Conradin, um, or, um, but even if you look at uh, Henry the Seventh, I mean, th there was still an option to um, maybe not not to reconquer the world Mediterranean because at that point it was really lost. But I mean, uh, at least dramatically shifting the balance of of power by maintaining Sicily in the hands of a of the Oenstauf and or another Germanic dynasty rather than in the Angevins, that was feasible, right? That was, was feasible. The Battle of Talia in 1268, well, Conradin had won, basically, right? They had done it. Well, Charles of Anjou was a hell of a fox. He, may, he was a, a great, pretty great man, right? And I tell it as a full Ghibelline, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Oh, maybe a not full Ghibelline, I'm actually like a kind of of white wealth, uh, or yeah, maybe Ghibelline, but from uh, well, it's complicated. At one point, we have to 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 discuss at one point, but um, I do recall, and that's why I, I hope to be balanced in my judgments. I mean, Charles of Anjou was a hell of of a ruler, right? And he was a freaking a giant in his own regard. We have never talked about him. You know what? And that's obvious because normally manuals don't talk much about him as such. But the Angevin Kingdom, yes, we discussed it in part, and um, that's a fascinating chapter. I must say, very, very fascinating. But as, as much as the French could do that, actually the, the Germans could as well. And, and the option there was, uh, there, were, there were many other factors in the, in the way, but there was also the general 
impression that the uh, that these people really cared about universalism as such like they truly believed it was still a thing it took it took a lot of time actually to secularize mindset in that regard it took another good century to do it and it was still shocking in you know in the most radical takes uh, most, um, you know, think about Marsilio from Padua, you know, these ideas that basically the, the Pope has had observed literally everything it was all about the Emperor, you know, the Pope was the Antichrist, something like that. In that specific context, I mean, the, the actual, I mean, the papacy for it had become, but uh, at that point it was lost and something else began. And, and that's why Frederick II is a figure of great... Um, great value because he was the last true universal ruler Europe ever had um, and there is no way to hide this like there were other tents there were other figures you can spot the universal um, you know eco in but it, it's not quite the same thing in the actuality of it like but we will discuss maybe this on another occasion for now let's stop here and I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.